thanks for playing games. We got Gladiator games next week. I promise they're going to be more exciting than that. Um, but there might, and the prizes are going to be more aggressive too because you get points. Points are a big deal for your team. All right, so I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going we're gonna to get into a fun conversation, okay? Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for bringing us here today, for all my friends in this room, and for us being able to play fun games um, and come together and have fun snacks and eat delicious zebra cakes and sugar ourselves up before we go home. And so I ask that as we're opening up tonight that you would um, open up our hearts and let us see something new of you today and that um, we would be open to what you have for us. I love you so much. Amen. So, welcome back to another conversation with Travis. Um, obviously, next week's Gladiator Games, we're all pumped. But this week, I wanted to have a really real conversation with you as we're going into this season of Gladiator Games. Um, because um, there's, I think there's one really simple question that the Lord asks us. And there's one question I think that's, that's been rattling around in my head over the course of my lifetime, and it's one that I think if we really take the time to answer it and dig into it, we'll see something interesting about ourselves and what God has for us and what he has us here for and what he has us here doing. And so this question, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you yet, but this question is that depending on your answer, will significantly impact how you interact with God, how you interact with yourself, how you interact with your family, how you interact with your teachers, your, your fellow classmates, how you interact with everybody. And I want to give you some context to this question. Oh, yes, Thomas. We're starting a new season of Gladiator Games, and I think that this question will even drastically change how impactful the Gladiator Games will be. I think that it will, uh, I want Gladiator Games to be a place where we can obviously crush the opposing team in heated color-based combat, obviously. But I also want it to be a place where we can have our friends and ourselves encounter Jesus in a new way, or for the first time. And so the question is this. We're going to have it up on the screen. Here's the, here's the question. What is my salvation through Jesus actually for? That's the question. What is my salvation through Jesus actually for? Now, whether you know it or not, you have already answered this question for yourself. It requires some thinking, and it might even be worth getting a nice hot cup of coffee or a cup of tea and thinking it over. But that's the question we're going to be unpacking, is what is your salvation actually for? I've come to find that we generally fall into a few different camps when it comes to this question, and it's important to know your answer, because as you'll start to find over the course of this evening, it drastically changes how you live your day-to-day -day life. So here's the few camps I think we fall in. We're going to have these up on the screen as well. The first one is this, that my faith and salvation in Jesus um, is something I only do because my parents drove me here. There's, there's a practicality there that maybe, maybe you came to know Jesus and started following him, but you just come here because your parents keep driving you. And you don't really want to be here, and that's okay, but you keep coming because your parents keep dropping you off. And then you're forced to hang out with me and do weird serial games. But this is the person that your day-to-day -day life is never really changed by a relationship with Jesus. This is the person that, you, that because you just keep being brought here, in your heart, you know that the second your parents stop bringing you, that Jesus is going to be a non-factor in your life. And that's a really real spot to be. Here's the second place. That my faith and salvation in Jesus is something that's only important to me on Wednesdays and Sundays. That all the other days of the week, and when I'm not here, it doesn't matter. I fell into this camp a lot in my life. This is the person who's really, really, really good at wearing a mask. That you're really, really good at acting. And secretly, you're two different people. 
that you're the person who's one person when you're here on Wednesday, and if you come on Sunday, you're one person. Or maybe you go hang out with your church friends on the weekend, sometimes, maybe. But if you do that, you, you're acting like that church person. But when you leave that and you're at school and nobody else is around, you act like somebody else. That if we saw you or caught you off guard, it would be strikingly different. And here's the third camp. That my faith and salvation through Jesus is merely a get-out-of-hell-free card. Or put differently, fire insurance, right? Maybe in this camp, maybe you might share the gospel because you're really scared of your friend going to hell. But other than that, your salvation is just that. I really just don't want to go burn in hell. And so I guess I'll just except Jesus, but nothing else actually changes. Or at worst, rather than being about a relationship with Jesus, he becomes about a to-do list that you have. I have to go to church. I have to read my Bible. I have to uh, share the gospel with people. I, he becomes a, a, a task list rather than a relationship. In your day-to-day -day life then, in, in, in this camp, your, your life and your faith in Jesus becomes very empty very, very fast. Because you, you don't have an answer for why you're doing what you're doing. You just see the task list in front of you, and you have to keep doing it because if you don't, then you're not a follower of Jesus anymore, I guess. But then you start to ask some hard questions about the future. Like, what do I keep doing the rest of my life? Is, is this just it? And so all of these answers, I think, fall short of what Jesus came and did for us. And I would imagine that each of you in this room, if you have a relationship with Jesus, fall into one of those categories. And that's really easy to do. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I think you're going to start to see throughout this, the rest of this conversation who Jesus is and why we're all about him here. And why you should be too. I fell into some version of all three of these for a very long time in my life. And it took Jesus really slowly peeling back the layers of my self-identity over a long and painful process for him to really take root and change my life. And so for a big part of high school, I especially struggled with the second one. That I was a really different person depending on the day. That when I was at youth group and I was hanging out and I was at gladiator games, I would, I would be one guy. But then I'd go back to school, and I'd be cussing up a storm. I was really, really, really mean, believe it or not. Oh, yeah. I know. So I was really, really mean, and I would act like all my other friends. And so looking back, I think I was scared to have a relationship with Jesus because I was afraid that he would restore me and change me too much. And I was unmotivated by that because I saw my relationship with Jesus as a list of chores I had to do. I had to do all the right things. And that with others, if I shared the gospel with others and did all the things, then that's, that's, all, that's all there was. And so the reality is, our salvation is for much, much, much more. And I want us to see that tonight. There's a much fuller and grander, fulfilling purpose. And if you have a relationship with Jesus, or even if you don't have a relationship with him, I want us to be open to what Jesus says he came here to do and why. And if you engage this with me, I promise that you'll leave encouraged. I promise that you will leave excited. But you have to be open with me. So here we go. In the beginning, that's where all good stories start. Genesis 1, God created everything. He created light. He created dark. He created the oceans. He created the plants. He created the animals. He created all sorts of things. And at the pinnacle, at the very crowning moment of this creation, he creates us. He creates humans. And here's the thing about humans. We're very, very different than everything else in that creation story. And here's, here's what it says here in Genesis 1, 26 and 27. It says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the, of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Then he says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So here's an important thing we need to see. There are two parts to this. We have a purpose and we have an identity. Those are two important things. So here's our purpose. God created the earth with us in mind. He created the earth, and then he gave it to us to rule over it. You see, this word here, I want to point it out, it says dominion. The word dominion here in this is actually um, a word that connotates royalty. The word dominion is one of which, of a king or a queen, how they would rule over their kingdom. And that's exactly what this passage in Genesis is evoking when it's talking about this. That when we are with God in the beginning of the world, that we are to be kings and queens in partnership with him, and our, what we rule over is the whole earth. Isn't that amazing? God looked at us and he said, guys, I made this amazing planet for you. I want to see what you do with it. I want to see how you grow it and cultivate it and make things out of it. We weren't supposed to stay in just a garden the whole time. God was expecting us to be creative. Because here's the second part. We're created in his image. And so this word image, if you take that back to the Hebrew, which is what the Bible was originally written in, it actually is the word statue. So the word image, you can think of a statue. So like, think of like an action figure. And God created a bunch of different action figures, right? And we all represent who he is by being us. There's no other, every human, this applies to everybody. Whether you follow Jesus or not, we bear the image of God in some way, shape, or form. And he represents, we represent him just by existing. And that's really different than how a lot of people view the world. But we have a unique identity. We represent God himself. So that is incredible. That as we're walking around in this world that God gave us, we're representing and literally being many versions of God as we're walking around and that's how people see other people and they know who God is, is because we're representing who he is while we're going around. So when we're here, when humans are here in the garden, God asks them a test. He puts kind of a test in front of them. And he says, guys, I need you to trust one thing, just one thing. I need you to trust my definition of good and evil. I need you to understand that me being the creator knows some things that you probably don't understand. And I need you to trust that I know what I'm doing and that when I say that I know what good and evil is, I need you to believe me. And of course, we know, unfortunately, that we didn't trust that. So Genesis 3 happens and we fall and we turn away from God and we distrust him, and we turn away, and we bring in sin and death and suffering and all these horrible things into the world. And so when we do that, we decide to define good and evil on our terms. But here's the important thing. I don't want us to miss this. These two things here aren't gone they don't go away because of that decision. If we go to Genesis 3.18, this is part of God's curse. He's explaining what's going to happen now that the world has changed and now that sin has been brought in. This is one of the things he says. He says, Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. So what he's saying is he's like, guys, you're still going to do all the things. You're still going to have dominion over the world. That's still your responsibility. I didn't take that away. But now when you try and grow stuff, when you try and do stuff, there's going to be thorns and there's going to be thistles. This is going to be really hard, is what he's saying. 
that when you try and have a good, strong relationship with one of your siblings or your classmates, one of you is sometimes going to betray each other. And you're going you're gonna to have a mistrust. And there's going to be broken relationships. And there's going to be thorns and there's going to be thistles. That sometimes when you're trying to um, engineer something and make a bridge that holds people and cars, there's going to be thorns and thistles because we can't perfectly engineer stuff anymore and the bridge might collapse. So sin doesn't destroy the mission, at least entirely. It just makes it extremely difficult. That if we were to be people who bring flourishing and life, instead we're bringing shame and death alongside of it. That when we argue, we argue with one another. We disagree, we mistrust each other. Instead of ruling as partners, we oppress as dictators. We lose sight of our ability to bring flourishing and the gift of life that God gives us <clears throat> because sin blocks and clouds our ability to do so. But then it's even worse, right? It's even worse. Because the world was our responsibility. And think of, think of the world as like a car. And God handed us the keys. And he says, you can take it wherever you want. And we crash it into a telephone pole. And when we crashed into a telephone pole, yeah, the airbags went off. Yeah, we got really hurt. We had to be life flighted, whatever. But the car is totaled. So he gave us that trust. We totaled the car. So Romans 8, 19, starting in verse 19, it says this. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. This is us, right? So we're the sons of God here. The creation is waiting for us to reveal something to it. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. The creation didn't do anything to get here. This was our fault. That's what verse 20 is saying. In hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of glory the children of the children of God. So the creation is sitting here and it's like, I desperately want to change. There are things that the people who rule over me have influence over, and I want this to be different. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who, were the who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So you see how this is all connected. The world that God gave us, us ourselves, are all interlinked, and it's all broken, and it's all waiting on something drastic to happen. Because right now, things are pretty grim. I don't know if you've looked around recently. But we have some grim stuff happening. We have a war happening over in Russia. We have wars happening within our own households. We have wars happening in our own classrooms with our teachers, with our fellow classmates, with that one kid. You know the one. But Jesus does something remarkable. That through his death and resurrection, he actually redeems us, he rids us of sin, and he brings us into relationship with him once again. But that relationship is more than just sharing Jesus with people. Obviously, you want to share Jesus with people. But it's to bring life it's to give you a new life. That he wants to do more through you. And so here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 16 through 20. From now on, therefore, the therefore is referring to above, and when he's talking, he's talking about everything Jesus did on the cross. Okay? So from, the, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. 
Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We're going to come back to that word. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world, the world, to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, and we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. This is incredible. This is the answer to our question of what our salvation is actually for. Don't miss it. What does this mean? The word reconciled or reconciliation is thrown around here a lot. This is actually a legal term that means to bring something back to how it once was. And so when you think about that in the, cre- in the, in the context of what we just talked about, there's a broken creation There's the car wrapped around the telephone pole. And Jesus is here to make new things out of us and out of the whole world. That he is here to bring everything back to him. That he's making everything new. Everything. That that was once broken is restored. And he is in the business of bringing restoration to all the brokenness we see around us. But then, don't miss this. He's reconciling the world to himself. And he's entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. We, because of what Jesus did, get to partner with him in making all things new once again. That is huge. That is what our salvation is for. And do you see this? Here's our connection point. Our salvation is for the life of the world. The life of the whole world. That is why Jesus came. Not just to get people out of hell. Not just to be a list of tasks of things to do. Not just to be something that we we are passing through, but to bring actual life and flourishing to the things around us. Ever since I came to Connect, which is, you know, three weeks now, so kind of a big deal, you know. Um, That's a joke. You're allowed to laugh. Um, I told you, and I've been asking you, some variant of our question since I came in, whether you realized it or not. I have been asking you about what your salvation is actually for, and we actually just did it a little bit ago when I asked you what you learned. I've asked most of you how school was this past week. Do you know what most of your answers are? They are some variation of, eh, it was school, so you know. And I ask you, what do you mean by that? And you say, eh, it's school, so you know, it's pretty terrible. Or you say, eh, it's just school, you know, like, it's, it's school. Or you give me some variation of, I can't wait till I'm out in the real world. But this, what Jesus did, tells us a contrary narrative to what you just told me. Your life doesn't start after school. It starts now. It's happening right in front of you. It's really important. Because our salvation is for the life of the world. Is your school in the world? Then yes. Your salvation is for the life of your school. Is your family in this world? Yes. So then your salvation is for the life of your family, for the life of your friend, for the life of your neighbor, for the life of the homeless man on the street, for the life of the president, for the life of... It's for all of it. 
but your life doesn't start after school. You see, Jesus has uniquely placed you in school around your specific classmates, around your specific teachers, and your specific community for a reason because he needs you to bring flourishing to that place. That he knows that there is immense and immeasurable brokenness in your school. And nobody else can go to school for you. I can't go to school in your place. Your mom can't go to school in your place. Your friend can't go to school in your place. Because they take attendance for you. So I can't go to school for you. If no one else can go to school for you, then that means that you are there because Jesus wants you there right now. Because he wants you and needs you. The world needs you to bring life into that place as somebody who's a reconciler of all things. So dream with me for a second. What would this look like for you as a student to bring flourishing to your school? Would it be just school? Or would it be more like a space where you learn as much as you can about the incredible world that Jesus made. It might look like you caring about the lives of your teachers. Does being a disturbance in class help bring them flourishing? No. Or would it be more helpful if you were a good and active learner? I'm not saying to be silent. I'm saying to engage them. Here's another question. How might you genuinely care for them? Your teacher's a human too. There's all sorts of answers to that. Or maybe, again, we're dreaming. How can you care for the kid that no one cares about in school? We all have one. There's always someone that everybody just despises. Everybody hates, and maybe you're that person. I don't know. But how can you care for them? Not because you feel bad for them, not because you pity them, but because you genuinely care about them as a fellow image bearer of Jesus, and because you want them to flourish as well. This even goes outside of school. I've been talking to you guys for a few weeks now. You guys have told me great things that you guys like to do. You guys like to fish. You like to go and be involved in plays and musicals, and you play music, and you're in band, and you cook, and you play video games, and you like coffee and art and, and sewing and all sorts of things. And cars. There's a million things that you guys are like. Here's the thing. I don't like all those things. And you don't like that whole list of things I just named either. That's okay. And that's a good thing because, believe it or not, that whole list, there's brokenness involved there too. And so as an image bearer, you've been wired a particular way and in a way that you're passionate about things that other people aren't passionate about. So use that. Bring life into that space too. Here's an example. One of my best friends, his name is Victor. Victor is an accountant. He's a CPA, and for some reason, he thinks it's really fun to do math and do people's taxes all day. I don't understand it, but he tells me, I, I talk to him almost every day. He, t he tells, he'll tell me, he told me a story just yesterday. He's like, Travis, I did this crazy tax return yesterday. It was so much fun. It took me 14 hours straight to finish it because it was for this big company, and they did like, da, 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 all this stuff, and he's like, it was just a blast, and I'm like, okay, Victor, I believe you, but dang, Here's the thing. We need the victors of the world. Because, I don't know about you, I don't like doing my taxes. I don't think any of you do either. But do you know why? I've asked Victor this before. Do you know why Victor likes doing taxes? Not because of the taxes, but because he sees something that's fundamentally broken in what he's looking at, and he knows that he can make it better. He knows that God has equipped him and put him uniquely at his company to help make life 
and flourishing and build something out of the brokenness that is the tax system. And that's really hard. But it's worth it. Because here's the thing. We all have an incredible mission. We have an incredible purpose. And all things matter to God. Everything. Everything matters. God created all of it. And so every single thing is his. He rules over it all. He gave it all to us. And he's in the business of restoring all things. And he invites us into that space. So here's what I want us to do. For just a couple minutes, I want us to do something maybe a little weird that might test your patience, but I'm asking for your patience. I would like you to close your eyes, and I'm not going to ask you to bow your head necessarily. You can, but what I am going to ask you to is to bow your heart. It's a posture that I'm asking you to take. A posture that says, I'm open to what you might be wanting to do with me, Jesus. I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird. I'm just asking you to close your eyes and think. What, and I'm going I'm to say some things. And I want you to be praying through this. And if you've never prayed before, it's just talking to God. There's no, there's no magic words or anything. But I want us to think for a second. And just engage this with me. So if we could all close our eyes and then think about this. hearts bowed. Let's reflect. Let the Lord speak to you. What is your salvation actually for? What's your honest answer to that question? How are you living your day-to-day -day life? Maybe you're here and you're wondering about salvation through Jesus through, for the very first time. That is awesome. And I would encourage you to do this. There's no magic words. There's no magic things to say. I would encourage you to pray. I would encourage you to ask for forgiveness for the things that, that you know you've done wrong. I'd ask you to confess the things that bring you shame the things that bring you hurt in your life. Bring it all to Jesus and ask him for forgiveness that he would turn your life around. That he offers that gift to you freely and he wants you to have that life. So if you've never done that before, now's a really good time. Are you the person who's here because they were, for a lack of a better phrase, forced to be here. What would it look like for you to take personal responsibility for your faith? Yeah, you're being forced to come, but you can do something about that. Make something out of it. Are you the person who's two different people depending on the week? Depending on the day. Is it Sunday or Wednesday? I'm this person. Is it Tuesday? I'm somebody else. What is Jesus asking of you so that he can actually restore your heart? So he can actually fix the brokenness that's, that's in you? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to cling closer to in order to have that barrier fall? Surrender that. Let him make you whole. Or maybe, maybe your faith is just a get out of hell free card. Maybe Jesus is a holy taskmaster for you. That if you don't do all the right things, he'll stop loving you. 
Let him give you peace in this moment. Jesus loves you where you are, but he wants so much more for you than that. He created you, he died for you, and he's restoring all things in you, through you, and around you. You should let him. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you take somebody even like me, somebody who's broken beyond belief, somebody who's seen some brokenness, somebody who's witnessing it constantly, that can't go a day without messing up in some way. Thank you that you take me where I am. And I'm even blown away that you would use somebody like me to bring restoration to the world. I, I, th th there's no greater purpose than that. To bring that life, to bring that joy, to bring that wholeness to others and to the, to the very thing that you so lovingly created, that is incredible. So thank you for, for putting me in the places that I am, for putting me around the people that I'm around, for giving me the neighbors that I have, because it's a great opportunity. And I ask for my friends in this room that you would do something incredible in them and through them and around them. I know you can and you are. There's some awesome people here. And I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful that you put them in the schools that they're in, around the teachers they're around, around the classmates that they're around. I'm thankful for that, Lord. Because you're doing something great in them. I ask that you would, you would give them a renewed sense of mind, that you would give them a restored heart and an excitement because you are with them and bringing them into something even greater than they can imagine. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, thanks for engaging that with me, guys. I appreciate it. Um, we are, we do have cereal, though, for real. Um, so uh, I'm going to just give me a second. Ashley and I are going to go set that up. She currently has a sleeping baby, so I'm going to have to go set up a table because she can't put the sleeping baby down to do that. Uh, I actually might need some help, Link. That'd be great. So I'm going to go set up 